In this episode of TTSA Talks, COO Steve Justice helps us get to know the legendary Dr. Hal Pudoff, TTSA's co-founder and VP of Science and Technology. Hi everyone and welcome to TTSA Talks. I'm Steve Justice and today I have with me Dr. Hal Pudoff. Hal is a co-founder of TTSA and the vice president of our science and technology division. I first heard about Hal uh, probably 25 years ago. Uh, There was a gentleman that I worked with that had worked with Hal in some previous projects and uh, talked about Hal's zero-point energy work. And so I got a chance to follow Hal. I, uh, I knew of his work. And um, I, it was one of those things that was just really interesting to me. And as we got in towards 2016 and 2017, uh, where I got to know Tom DeLong, uh, Hal was working with Tom at that time. Hal being, again, as I said, one of the co-founders of To The Stars Academy. And uh, actually got a chance to meet Hal for the first time in in 2016 uh, and and go to dinner with him and just spend time with him. And it was absolutely delightful. I think you're going to see a lot of his personality come out here today in a a way that you really haven't had a chance to see. As I talked about in the the previous podcast where, where Lou interviewed me, right after I retired, I took a trip to Austin, Texas to Hal's Earth Tech uh, company and uh, sat down with Hal and his team for a few days and I saw pictures of Hal sitting with Dr. Teller, a uh, famous physicist. Uh, I got to, to talk to Hal about all the different work that he was doing and it was, a, it was an absolutely delightful couple of days and I hope you find this podcast to be equally as delightful. He has published papers on so many subjects, including general relativity and space propulsion. Uh, He has lots of patents in laser communication and energy fields. Just a a brilliant, brilliant man, but also just one of the kindest human beings you would ever want to meet on the face of this earth. So thank you so much, Hal, for being here today. Well, thanks, Steve. I I appreciate the opportunity to uh, chat with you about all this stuff. Good. Um, so where you're sitting, where are you right now? I'm in uh, Austin, Texas, and uh, due to COVID, I'm uh, Zooming from home, so to speak. And uh, so that, that's where I'm uh, carrying on my work these days. Well, it's, it's really good to see you and really good to, to be able to sit down and, and chat with you. So first of all, let, let's talk a little bit about what made you who you are. Uh, what's your background? Where'd you grow up, um, and what got you interested in science? Well, interestingly enough, uh, I started out in Miami, Florida in my uh, high school days, and I wanted to be a disc jockey. <laughs> so I went to, uh, I went to in fact, I, I, I did go to a, a vocational school and radio, had radio communications as my, as my topic, and during the summers, I did I was a disc jockey, HP the cool one, they, they called me at the time. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. I love it. I love anyway, it. Anyway, uh, as part of uh, radio communications, I got interested in ham radio. So while I was still in high school, I built my own ham radio and uh, talked all over the world. And so that just that got me absolutely uh, hooked on science in general. And then, <clears throat> as it turns out, a key thing that occurred uh, while I was in high school is an article came out in the Miami Herald talking about uh, the two, two, two article series talking about how all the aerospace corporations and the government were very interested in anti-gravity and they're all working to see if they couldn't uh, you know develop that that kind of technology and that for some reason I just caught my fancy that that that's so uh got my attention that actually I went out to a technical bookstore and I bought a graduate level textbook on electrical engineering and, and uh, put it on my bedside table. And I said, someday I'm going to understand this book. And so now, as it now turns how out, old were you, how old were you when you bought this graduate level book? 
I was probably 16, 15, 16. <laughs> wow. And interestingly enough, in my master's degree program, when I eventually was at the University of Florida, I actually used that textbook in a graduate level, in a graduate level course. So anyway, that's, that's what kind of sparked my interest. And so over the years, uh, even while I was getting my engineering degree uh, at the University of Florida, by the way, there's an interesting aspect there also, uh, as I got ready to uh, graduate, uh, th that was back in the time of the draft and so on. So I also joined the Naval Reserves and I became a Naval uh, Reserve Officer. And I was about ready to go on active duty in 58, but that's when uh, Sputnik went up in October of 57. And so Congress passed a law saying that anyone who uh, was in a technical area could stay for a master's degree program. So I stayed there at University of Florida in Gainesville, uh, did part-time work at Sperry Electronics and uh, did my master's uh, thesis there on a new form of uh, focusing hollow electron beams. In fact, I did such a good job on that that when I left to go into the Navy, uh, they said, well, you know, if, if you want to come back to the University of Florida, uh, we'll accept your master's thesis as a PhD dissertation. But uh, I, I decided I, I didn't want to take a chance on, on necessarily some years later deciding to uh, go back there. So I, I said, thanks, but no thanks. I'll, I'll take my master's degree and, and get going. Now, interestingly enough, because I was a Naval officer, uh, with a technical background, I ended up getting uh, sent to the National Security Agency. Now, this, this is a, a, a critical feature in my interest in off weird topics. And that is, of course, NSA at the time was uh, developing all kinds of high-speed computers about that time. Computers on the street were running at about a megahertz. And uh, we needed gigahertz computers for, uh, for code breaking of Russian encrypted uh, messaging and so on. And so I was put in charge of developing a computer, an optical computer that was a thousand times faster than anything on the street. And so I, I did a pretty good job. We got up to 750 megahertz and uh, I even got a certificate of commendation from the director of NSA. But basically the important feature here for what we're talking about today is the fact that I suddenly realized that at least behind closed doors, uh, technologies are being developed that are just sort of off the charts in comparison to what's out there in the public. And so that made me uh, recognize that, you know, if I ever had a chance to get involved in, in that kind of work, for the government again, I would certainly take it. And as the years went by, uh, eventually, because of my interest, I was invited to join uh, uh, Robert Bigelow's uh, group called National Institute for Discovery Science, where he was looking into all kinds of unusual topics, including UFOs and things happening at Skinwalker Ranch and all that kind of thing. And so that's when I sort of got uh, my feet wet about the UFO area, which I, which I found uh, really interesting. And uh, we had people like Ed Mitchell, who was a Apollo astronaut, and other people who were interested in UFOs. And that's where I basically learned about the, uh, the UFO topic. And because of that exposure, um, it turned out that uh, when Bigelow finally uh, responded to a DIA request in 2007 to set up the ATIP program, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, for uh, the DIA uh, to investigate UFOs, uh, since I've been involved with him and his National Institute for Discovery Science, he invited me to be part of that. So uh, that's how I got officially involved in the Pentagon's program. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, I had already set up uh, Earth Tech International in Austin, Texas, and so I had funding to pursue advanced topics, and so the idea of being part of that kind of program uh, fit right in. Now, now, real quick, just to back up for one second, um, where did you get your PhD? 
Well, I got my PhD at Stanford University. It turns out, uh, as I mentioned, I went to uh, NSA as a Naval Intelligence Officer between my master's and my PhD. And then after I got out of uh, NSA, actually got out of the Navy, and I actually stayed on at NSA for a while uh, as a civilian. But then I was sent out to uh, Stanford to get my PhD. And so uh, I was still actually an NSA employee, although not advertising it, of course, because this is back in, in the days of uh, a lot of uh, negativity about government actions and so on. But anyway, after I was on the Stanford campus for a year or so, I decided, okay, I probably wouldn't want to go back to NSA, never be able to publish anything and so on. So, so I quit my NSA uh, position. <clears throat> but I graduated from Stanford as part of my work there uh, at the time, lasers were not tunable. You, you know, like with your little uh, handheld uh, laser pointer that's got one color associated with it. Other lasers have their colors associated with them. I actually invented a tunable laser where I could tune the colors. And so that was one of the first uh, lasers of that type. And so while I was at Stanford, I developed this tunable laser and uh, it ended up, we got it patented. And uh, that was also my dissertation. So once again, I was sort of out there in the forefront of doing impossible things. Uh, and at the time that was considered kind of an impossible thing. So uh, that's just a continuation of my being interested in, in pushing the envelope. And I have to admit that, you know, if I'm just doing something kind of standard, adding a couple more decimal places or something, uh, I'm bored. So I'm always on the lookout. So let's, let's, let's talk about that just a little bit, because that's one of the, the really, I, I believe, unique things uh, uh, about you and your, your, your interest and, and motivators. You, you like the hard things to do, the difficult things to do. You like the seemingly impossible, the, the diving into new areas. And, mm -hmm. and when I went to your lab in Austin the first time, one of the things that really struck me was you had these incredibly complex scientific experiments, but that were accomplished through relatively simple means. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that simple is, not, is uh, S simple is sometimes very difficult to achieve. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, um, it's, it's one of those very distinct challenges in science where it's really easy to go down the deep technology path. And so if you could talk uh, just a little bit about your, your approach in here, because it was, it was a recurring thing. You, you, you simplified very complex, both concepts as well as we'll call very complex experiments, but you approach them from a very simple, you, 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 the in manifestation of them was a very simple approach. Can you, can you expand on that thought process a little bit for me? I, yeah, I can give you a perfect example. <clears throat> At Earth Tech, um, since we're interested in, you know, new forms of say energy and propulsion for space flight, that was one of our our remits from our sponsors uh, that therefore made me interested in, okay, well, uh, are there any new uh, forms of energy or new forms of propulsion uh, that, you know, would really push the envelope or whatever. And so uh, I got funding to <clears throat> pursue that. We had what we called the Maverick Inventor Program. We decided that, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is as smart as we think we are, uh, we may not be able to come up with a new energy or propulsion uh, source or whatever. It may be some guy in the garage who doesn't know what he's doing, who tries some experiment that no physicist in their right mind would ever think of trying, and he might just stumble on uh, a breakthrough in energy or propulsion. So I said, okay, well, I, I think this Maverick Inventor Program, we, we have to turn that into, into, into the real deal. And so the simplified aspect is uh, we ask ourselves, well, how do you measure energy? Well, it turns out a very fundamental kind of structure 
to, 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 to measure energy is what's called a calorimeter. Um, and so we built- oh, Okay, describe what a calorimeter is. A calorimeter is a, a very, in principle, simple idea. And that is, if you have a new energy source, use it to heat water. And when you see the temperature go up, you'll know uh, how much energy has uh, gone into that water. And so the idea is we would build a calorimeter. Now, it took a million dollars in a couple of years to build a really high quality <laughs> calorimeter, but, but the, the principle is very simple. And so then we would advertise, uh, if you think you have new uh, source of energy, for example, I mean, and we got a lot of people bringing us cold fusion devices, new forms of magnetic uh, energy generators. And the thing is they'd bring them in and we would measure their input energy with this calorimeter. We'd measure the output energy with this calorimeter. We would see if they were uh, generating more energy than you could count for wh what you're putting in, which would be, be, be the goal. And unfortunately I have to say that um, our website is a graveyard of dashed inventors <laughs> dreams because although we tested more than say 50 devices, um, we found out that in, 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 in all the cases where they thought they had something, it turned out was some kind of artifact. And uh, so we, we didn't actually find a new source, but still it was, it was a pursuit worth pursuing because as far as our investors were concerned, you know, if only one in a million worked, uh, that would pay for everything. <laughs> So that, 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 that was a big effort. A second effort, it was, uh, uh, which involved the device which you saw when you were at our lab, is really, in principle, pretty simple. We decided to measure Newton's law of gravity. I mean, standard measurement, which went back to whatever, 1700s and so on. But anyway, people have heard about uh, the idea that, well, there's dark matter, there's dark energy, and all that kind of thing. Uh, one of the ideas about uh, dark matter is simply the fact that if you take a look at a, the solar system and um, you calculate the orbits that you should be getting from uh, Newton's law, simple form of gravity, you find out that uh, the planets, uh, in fact, aren't exactly following the law as you'd expect them to follow. And so that's when it, uh, astrophysicists came up with the idea, well, well, maybe there's some additional dark matter in there that, that are holding the planets in more than you'd expect from, a, from your calculations. Well, we took a different view and that. That's the view most astrophysicists took, but we took the view of, okay, well, maybe it's just that Newton's law of gravity uh, under the conditions of the slow kind of accelerations and movements that pl outer planets have, maybe gravity has a stronger effect. So we decided, okay, we'll let the astrophysicists chase their theories, but we're gonna go in the lab, we're gonna build a simple device to measure Newton's law of gravity for very slowly moving objects, moving at the rate that you'd have a planet at the outer edges of the solar system moving. And so we built a very sensitive uh, gravity measuring device. I mean, we could not have cars in the parking lot because the car's gravitational attraction would set off the experiment. And uh, of course you've got uh, cars going along highways that are not too far away. So you have to do some very sophisticated things like uh, measure them in an oscillating format so that you could dig the signal out of the noise on the computer. Okay, so, so, so real quick for everybody that doesn't do this for a living, <laughs> anything that has mass has gravity associated yes. with it right exactly right. so any a car a person any of that kind of stuff and so you know you had your fixed building and that kind of thing so you were trying to fix the environment around you you know and all the stuff in your lab all, all the stuff on the shelves and everything all had mass so that was relatively stable and so you what you didn't want to have was a car there one day and not the next and that kind of thing that represented a exactly. change in masses around the thing. And this is where, because the experiment took place over what time period? We gathered data for like two years. Right. And so <laughs> you had to deal with traffic driving back and forth 
out there on the adjacent highway. Um, but you tried to control as many chunks of mass as you possibly could during the experiment. Right. Right. For example, and, we could not walk into our laboratory when we were taking data. Right. <laughs> the body's mass would be enough to throw the experiment off. So anyway, what could be simpler than measuring Newton's law of gravity? But it was for a very profound purpose to try to uh, resolve a great astrophysical riddle. And of course, we still have that riddle. 96% of our universe is dark matter and dark energy. So what we think we know is only about 4% of what's going on. So that's still a big area to investigate. So what was your basic finding from this? Because when you would look at the apparatus, it looked you know, to the casual observer that didn't know what they were looking at, it looked like a, a kid's carousel. It was a big log beam on a pivot. Um, very, very simple looking device. Uh, but what, what results did you get out of it? Well, very interesting result, actually. We were looking to see if maybe Newton's law of gravity at very slowly moving, for very slowly moving objects uh, changed. But in fact, we did not see that. On the other hand, we got a great publication out of it because we measured Newton's law of gravity down to lesser values of gravity than had ever been measured in the history of the Earth. So we got a super paper out about measuring Newton's law of gravity as being quite right on down to gravitational attractions that were less than had ever been measured before. Can, so, can you, so when you yeah. say less than ever measured before, give give the is there a number you can provide? Uh, let's see, off the top of my head, it'd be I don't know something like uh, ten to the minus tenth meters per second squared or something. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's really weird. Be, it would be on the order of um, a person, thousand, a person walking across the, a person walking. Uh, by your instrument at uh, you know a thousand feet away or something. Anyway. Okay, but it's 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 billions, less than billionths of a percent. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's just this it's tiny, way, way tiny, tiny. Because uh, what is it? Nine point eight meters per second squared is exactly, Earth's and we're measuring down to trillions of that. Trillions Almost. of yes. that. Yeah. So extremely accurate measurement from a relatively simple looking device but it was it, it because it was rather simple looking when you it was look. simple looking and uh the thing was uh so how do we get around noise like cars going by and so on well we would simply move the objects that we were testing the gravity between on an oscillating motion and so therefore we could go into the computer and only pick out the measurements that occurred at that oscillating value. And so that's, that's how we're able to quote, as we say, dig the signal out of the noise. It, so it was, it was a very simple conceptual experiment, but it took a lot of sophistication to actually do it. Oh, absolutely. And that's what I say. It, it doesn't mean it was easy. Simple is, does not mean easy. Right. And uh, and that's one of the things that I thoroughly enjoy about the discussions with you, because as we would start talking about wormholes or or engineering the the space time metric, one of the things you were able to do for me was bring things down to very very simple terms, and so um, you know I want to I, I want to get to that in just a few minutes, but that. My, my experience with you comes from TTSA. And so I wanna, I wanna make sure our audience here understands uh, how you got together with Tom, um, how, you, how you came up with the idea of To The Stars Academy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, then, and then we'll go into some of the projects of TTSA. So how, how did you meet Tom? And uh, what, how did you get To The Stars Academy? Up, up and running, because since you're one of the founding members. Well, as I said, I, I did get uh, involved in the Pentagon's UFO program, or we call UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. I was a senior advisor and a contractor. And so I did get uh, very much involved in, uh, in the technical aspects 
of the UFO program for the government before I ever heard of or, or met Tom. And uh, in that program, um, again, following my, my, my usual mode, my particular task was to recognize that uh, you know, if we're going to solve the problem of UFOs and how they, their technology works and so on, we're going to have to go way beyond what we know today. And so, in fact, I commissioned 38 papers from top scientists around the world in their areas of expertise, whether it be, uh, oh, say, uh, invisibility cloaking or warp drive or... Uh, new kinds of materials that might have uh, some possibility of controlling gravity and that kind of thing. So anyway, I got, I got totally turned on and immersed in all that. And once again, so I'm always looking forward for something. And as it turns out, about that time, there was an interview of Tom DeLong by George Knapp on his uh, Las Vegas uh, podcast, a radio station. And Tom went on about how he had uh, started talking to people in the aerospace industry and in government. And he proposed the idea that, uh, you know, maybe may, may a kind of structure that he might set up that would involve the public rather than uh, just, you know, secret government work, you know, might be a way to go to, to, to make some headway in the subject area. And that caught my attention. I, I, you know, I'd never heard of Blink-182 or whatever, so, <laughs> but anyway, when I said, you know, I, I'm, I've been talking to Tom DeLong, uh, you know, Blink uh, band there, and, and all my kids say, oh my God, you know, he's, he's the top of the line guy, and I said, yeah, but it turns out he's interested in the same kind of things I'm interested in, so, so anyway, uh, at some point, uh, Tom suggested we all meet in San Diego, and so, uh, I showed up for that meeting, and uh, so after hearing this uh, interview of Tom um, by George Knapp, I, I got in touch with him and said, uh, you know, I'm, I, I've been involved in this kind of research for the government, and uh, I like your concept, what you're describing, so yeah, I'd like, I'd like, to, I'd like to meet you and, and discuss, uh, you know, any kind of forward motion here, so he he invited me to come out to Encinitas and um, Jim Simavan, uh, who I also knew. And uh, so we had a discussion and then Tom put out his idea of having a, some kind of public benefit corporation to explore this area, to collaborate with whoever would be willing to collaborate with us in the real world, like government and, and aerospace corporations, but nonetheless to have as its goal to explore the UAP area from a strictly scientific standpoint and to share whatever results uh, we found with the public. And so that was the concept of the Public Benefit Corporation. Somehow that caught my attention as being a, a very cool thing to think of uh, going forward with. So <clears throat> when he asked me if I'd be willing to consider being a vice president for science and technology. I said, uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll sit on your board and, 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 and play and, and be in that role. And so uh, that's sort of how we then uh, set up launching TTSA, the meeting in Seattle. And, um, and the rest is history and a growing history. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so there's um, there was a number of uh, we'll call it scientific um, uh, studies that you had going on at uh, at Earth Tech that became part of the scope of of TTSA, and the the one that was really fascinating to me was the um, space time metric engineering mm -hmm. effort. Um, so I, I had my chance to sit down and talk with you about it. Uh, so, for for the audience out there, uh, can you explain what the the space time metric engineering uh, what it what it means, uh, what uh, what kind of where we are with that, mm -hmm. um, okay. and and your vision 
for where we need where we can take it. Okay. You know, the average person on the street uh, hears that, uh, well, according to Einstein, you can't go fast in the speed of light. Uh, well, that's a general idea that people have. It's based on what's called special relativity, theory of special relativity. But it turns out that uh, although that was developed in 1905, by 1915, uh, Einstein moved forward into the general theory of relativity. And it turns out the general theory of relativity has some, you might say, shortcuts and backdoors at the Alamo and uh, end around run aspects. And so that's why we have, even in the pop popular culture, you know, films like Interstellar, where you're talking about uh, warp drive and faster than the speed of light kind of drive. That's all part of, of general relativity. Now, it turns out that <clears throat> If you look around and say, okay, uh, who's investigating general relativity? Well, it's, it's basically astrophysicists are worried about uh, black hole mergers and neutron stars and all that kind of thing. But I came at it from a wholly different standpoint. I said, okay, in electromagnetism, we have a set of equations called Maxwell's equations. And basically those equations are what we use to develop everything from light bulbs to batteries to Wi-Fi, uh, you name it. But no one ever thought of taking Einstein's equations for general relativity and saying, okay, well, let's look at these from an engineering standpoint. Suppose I could engineer general relativity equations of Einstein, just like all the electrical engineers engineer Maxwell's equations for electromagnetic effects. Uh, no one had ever thought of doing that actually. So, but anyway, that was my challenge that I gave myself and I actually gave myself that challenge as I was part of the uh, government's uh, UAP program. And so I did a really interesting thing. I said, okay, looking at how UAP phenomena seem to occur and looking at say electrical equations, Maxwell's equations, I, I don't think we're gonna handle it that way. It's just it, it, we, we don't see a way forward there. So, well, what about general relativity? And so I got a piece of paper, and on one side of the piece of paper, I wrote down all the weird claims of people who claim to observe UAP phenomena. And the claims are, you know, can be pretty weird. Uh, you know, drove over my car and my car lifted off the ground or uh, it put out this enormously brilliant light and you know, just on and on. In fact, from my standpoint, for what I was attempting to do, the more weird the description, the better. Because if someone is just making up a story, they want it to sound rational and it makes sense. So when somebody tells you, you know, there was a craft that it was, you know, only 30 feet across, but when I got inside, it was as big as a football field, you know, that kind of stuff. You say, oh my gosh, you know, who would make that up if they want to sound rational? So there may be something to that. So anyway, there's my list of weird phenomena on the left-hand side of the piece of paper. And so that I said, okay, suppose I take general relativity, Einstein's equation for general relativity, uh, and I write down what kind of effects I might be able to see uh, if I was able to engineer those equations. I wrote those down on the right side of the piece of paper and I got a match. I got a match between unusual reported phenomena on the one hand and what would happen if you could in principle engineer Einstein's general relativity equations. And so that convinced me, okay, then I, I think this is the way to go. And so space-time metric engineering, well, general relativity has to do with the space-time metric, that is time and space as we usually know it, but can get distorted in general relativity. And so I say, okay, uh, now one might ask, well, well, if you've got the equations and you think you know how it works, why haven't we built one? Well, it turns out that uh, to get those very large macroscopic effects, as we would say. It looks like you need a lot of energy and a very tiny volume and so on. So, so we haven't yet engineered it, but nonetheless, I think we have the blueprint 
for the direction to go to try to engineer it. So that, that, that's become a passion of mine. And so when uh, we sat down to talk about possible engineering concepts and projects to pursue with the TTSA, I said, okay, space-time metric engineering, that's one of the items that's got to go on the list. I mean, there's, there's a lot to do in terms of computer modeling and so on, carrying out some experiments to measure weak space-time metric engineering effects that we can then begin to, in the long run, uh, engineer up to, to be of real use. So anyway, that's how that project got started. And, and Tom and others on the board said, okay, well, that you've, you've made a strong argument here. So, um, and you were part of the support of uh, going in that direction. So, so that, that's an area that, that, that I'm really uh, up on. One of the things that was really interesting to me, I got an email from you one time saying, oh, do you know of any like really big power source that can fit into a little tiny space that, that <laughs> may explain why we're seeing, you know, the effects of a black hole, but in, in something very small, because uh, one of the slides in your deck on, on space-time metric shows this distortion effect as a function of how close you are to like a black hole or a sun, mm -hmm. something like that, where the the variables to density or, you know, are variables to mass, frequency, time, all those things that you saw, uh, length was one of those, like you talked mm -hmm. about, um, somebody stepping inside of a field or whatever it was and suddenly dimensions seemed to change. Um, you saw those effects as you would get close to one of these giant masses in space, like a black hole. And the question was, how do you replicate that inside of a vehicle? And the, when you and I talked on the phone, it was about, there must be some mechanism that is simulating the effect of a black hole. They, they, there's a, a synthesis of it. Do you remember mm -hmm. this? Do you remember this discussion? I do remember. Yes. <laughs> very, very interesting. Very, and, very uh, relevant. And, and that's where, um, you know, for, for our audience sake, where this collecting um, materials that, that could be from um, uh, crashes or whatever it happens to be, things, unusual materials, are, are they a clue to how you might, you know, create the, uh, I'll call it the, the energy source mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. engineering the space-time metric is—is is that a is that a valid set of statements? I want to make sure. Yes, that, that that's a valid set of statements. And uh, since, in general, we don't make things in the lab that create these unusual general relativity space-time metric engineering effects, that means that therefore there must be some exotic material of some kind. Uh, it might be, you know a black hole, many black holes that, you know, maybe we'll find floating around in the cosmos at some point and be able to, to grab hold of them. And, and, and that, that might be a boost. Or we might find out that some unusual combinations of materials uh, do an end around run and create these uh, space-time metric engineering effects without a lot of energy. I mean, that, that, that would be great. So in fact, that's why I've been interested in, uh, in, in the TTSA program, Project Atom, in collecting any, any materials that we can get that are claimed to have somehow been involved in, in a UAP uh, phenomena, whether it's crash retrieval or pieces falling off or whatever. And so uh, that's why interesting materials attract my attention. All right. I, and an analogy for our audience could be, you know, the way we originally got light at night was from a fire that also created lots of heat, but now we can synthesize light. You have, you know, first came light bulbs, which did put out a lot of, of heat also, but it was a very different way of creating light. And now you have LEDs that create mm -hmm. light with almost no heat whatsoever, but they use a very different energy source than burning wood to create light. So, you know, the question is, is, is there some sort of synthesis of these big energy sources that may allow us to do this? Is that a fair analogy? Yeah, that's a fair analogy. And I think, you know, we're at the beginning of that path. But given that there are observed phenomena 
that show that one way or another, it must be possible to get very far along that path. Uh, so that, that's one of the interesting things of uh, UAP phenomena, investigating UAP phenomena, which is rather than sort of starting from scratch, coming up with an idea and see if you can develop something that may or may not uh, work, here we've got exhibits that there are phenomena that apparently do engineer the space-time metric. And so we've already got, uh, you know, something, a, a quiver, an arrow in our quiver that says, in principle, it must be possible to get from here to there. And uh, especially, uh, and, and there are some very good sightings. I mean, uh, Kelly, you know, at the Skunk Works early on, and some of his engineers had some observations from many different directions at the same time of a really exotic kind of craft. And so, uh, you know, therefore you have really high quality observers who are very uh, adept at aerospace technologies, having reported seeing just this kind of advanced craft uh, performing in such a way that it's not just depending on wings and jet fuel and so on. So anyway, uh, that, that's a very encouraging element. It's like getting to look over the hill and see uh, where you're gonna get when you come down the other side. Uh, so therefore it's worth climbing that hill. I, I agree. I, you know, one of the things I always would remind, you know, my, uh, you know, one of the things I would always remind my mentees is the impossible is just something you haven't seen yet. And, and this is something that we're seeing. So mm -hmm. we shouldn't treat it as impossible. There were, there's been things throughout our history that we consider to be impossible, you know, going faster than the speed of sound or, you know, flying even, uh, for a while. I remember one, one statement was, you know, humans will never go faster than 50 miles per hour because mm -hmm. we couldn't breathe you know, at speeds greater than that. And yet all of these are, are just temporary obstacles. And, and this is another one of those, but we know this can be done. We, yes. There's, there's yes. enough reliable, you know, information collected, not only from human witnesses, but from, you know, now electronic sensors, radars and infrared systems and electro optical systems. This, this say this kind of, physics, it appears, can be done. So then the question is, how do you do it? And that's left up to us to go figure out. So fascinating subject. Absolutely, absolutely. Another fascinating subject, um, which is in a sense more mundane, but on the other hand, a real potential breakthrough is the idea of beamed energy propulsion. It turns out that one of the uh, TTSA projects that we're looking at is in an area which we call beamed energy propulsion. When you look at ordinary uh, you know, rocket propulsion to get into orbit, uh, you know, most of the money, most of the expenditure, most of your problem is carrying the fuel on the rocket as the rocket launches toward uh, space. And so the actual payload that gets in space is, you know, 10% or less of the actual weight that you had to lift off the earth. That's because you're carrying the fuel with you. Well, it turns out there's a whole other option. Uh, and it's not an option that you have to wonder if it's going to work. It's an option that has in fact been explored and proven. And that is, okay, let's not have our rocket carry any fuel. Well, how are you gonna do that? Well, let's say we have a very powerful laser on the ground that shoots a laser beam at the back of the rocket. And then the rocket uh, launches upward, not carrying any fuel. And it's not just, uh, you know, photon momentum from the laser light. No, no, it's not that. You can have material on the back of your rocket 
uh, or your satellite that you're trying to launch and the intense laser beam uh, shoots at the back and heats up that material and that makes a plasma behind your little rocket and that plasma gives an enormous uh, thrust to the rocket and, and off it goes. Well, it turns out that this is a technology that has been uh, investigated and actually experiments done and proven both by NASA and by the Air Force. And so, whereas right now it ta costs something like $10,000 per kilogram to put a rocket into orbit or more, this beamed energy propulsion from the ground can get you up there at like $1,000 per kilogram. In other words, we can get a 90% reduction in the cost of launching things by beamed energy propulsion versus the old fashioned way with rocket fuel. So why, why hasn't that uh, you know, taken off and we see it every day? Well, for a while it took uh, you know, laser development to, to debeef itself up to where it was actually a, a real competitor. And it has now reached that point. So right now, when you look at the materials on a piece of paper and you say, my God, this is the only way to go. But of course, you're talking about building a whole infrastructure to launch that kind of a technology. And you're competing with a very mature infrastructure with the rocket fuels. And so <clears throat> it, it's, it's a hard startup. It's a hard startup, but nonetheless, uh, I think it's only a matter of time. And uh, that'll, be, that'll be the only, only way to go, only way to fly, so to speak. And it turns out that especially a, a, a contributing factor is that our electronics have gotten so well engineered to be so small that now satellites are smaller and smaller and we have so-called CubeSats and NanoSats, which are really relatively small. So the kind of laser powers we have available now can launch them. So someone just has to build up the, uh, the infrastructure uh, and get out there and compete. And one of the nice features of it is you could launch 20, 30 of these a day if you wanted to. I mean, you just push the button and off it goes. So uh, this is a technology that uh, TTSA has committed itself to uh, seeing if we can't find uh, a way to get that uh, moving ahead. Well, Hal, listen, we have talked about a lot of technologies out there. I know we've answered a lot of people's questions about the a number of the subjects and pursuits that TTSA has, but we do have some questions from the social media world. You mind taking a few of those? I'm glad to. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So Ryan Sprague asks, um, Hal, in all your work throughout the years, working with SRI now TTSA and many other corporations, how have you, how have these varying phenomena affected you on a personal? and existential level? That's a good question. And beginning with my getting involved in the early NSA work where we're gonna build uh, computers that were a thousand times faster than any others, that basically opened uh, kind of a pathway in my own psyche for, okay, uh, let's always look for something that's a real challenge that's really out there. And so what that has done has um, sort of sculptured my scientific and technical work to always be looking at the edges of what's known and what might be beyond the boundaries that, that we've already incorporated. So I'm just, uh, I suppose you could say, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm hooked <laughs> on looking at the forward boundaries of any scientific area. So, you know, all someone has to tell me is that they don't think something can be done. And I'm right on it to try to figure, okay, well, if it can't be done, then, then how can we do that? <laughs> and so the main effect that's had on me is that, that, that I've always been open to new ideas, always searching the boundaries. I mean, I've looked at a lot of nonsense stuff and discarded it. So it's not like uh, I'm so open-minded, my brains are falling out. But nonetheless, uh, looking 
at future possibilities, uh, connecting up with visionary people. I mean, that's just my lifestyle. And so in that sense, it has affected me tremendously because that just uh, is my guiding lodestar, you might say. And and I'll I'll just chime in here. One of the, the things that, as I watch you operate, Hal, that I really appreciate, there is that open-minded approach, but with scientific rigor. So you, you have the passion for this, and you can tell it's almost genetic inside mm-hmm. of you. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you have that, that balancing element of the scientist inside of you. And so it's a, it's a really interesting, interesting combination. That's a, that's a great question, Ryan. All right, our next question is from Dan Warren. And he says, Dr. Pudoff has been digging into the phenomenon in an official capacity for decades and continues to pursue it. What is it about the phenomenon that has kept you pushing this hard for this long? And what do you hope to learn about it going forward? Well, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, an early article in, in, in the Miami Herald when I was in fact still a teenager that talked about the possibility of aerospace corporations and the government investigating anti-gravity and the idea that we could, in principle, explore our solar system and then explore the stars. I mean, that that is just somehow is such a, a thrilling concept to me that uh, whenever I come across any new idea in the field of energy or propulsion or whatever that makes me think that there's a contribution or a pathway to begin to open up the possibility of humankind exploring the cosmos on, on a grander scale, uh, that just uh, is, is, is a driving factor in, in, in my psychology. Our next question comes from Arthur Iglesias. He said, Steve Justice said the metamaterials behave as subcritical waveguides. <laughs> what does that mean? He also says they should not be able to carry energy through it. What can you tell us about this discrepancy? So obviously, I wasn't as clear as I needed to be in defining what a subcritical waveguide was. Okay, well, I can, I, I can answer that in, in great detail, actually. <clears throat> it turns out that as part of our exploration of looking at new materials that might have exotic properties and so on, uh, one of the materials that uh, came our way uh, was uh, in, in an, a kind of a material that these days in modern technology and science is called metamaterial. And so it turns out that uh, this particular material, very interestingly uh, structured, it had uh, thick layers of magnesium, and then inside those layers of magnesium, there were thin layers of bismuth. And so it's an unusual structure. Uh, when we first came across it, we did a big search. Uh, well, who, who makes this kind of stuff? I mean, is this a standard material development that uh, is, is being looked at and so on? But even in the classified literature, we could find no evidence that anybody bothered to make this kind of material. And, and the first efforts of trying to reproduce it uh, found it was very difficult to get these materials to, to bond together. And so it really seemed to be an exotic material. Now to get specifically to the question that, that he asked and that uh, he's not satisfied with your answer. <laughs> I, can, I can answer <laughs> you that. You love very, that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can answer that very precisely. It turns out that <clears throat> when you uh, want to transmit, um, let's say, uh, gigahertz or microwave signals from one point to another, we use what are called waveguides. And so a waveguide can be like a metal pipe and you can send the signal down through the pipe. And that's how you might send a signal from, let's say a transmitter on surface of a carrier up to an antenna or whatever. Well, those waveguides have to have dimensions on the order of the wavelength of the signal you're trying to send. So for example, um, 
three gigahertz uh, signal may have a certain size in terms of centimeters and so on. So ordinarily, if you're going to send a signal from one place to another through a waveguide, you have to build your waveguide to be of the dimensions of the wavelength of, of the signal you're trying to send. However, it turns out that in this metamaterial kind of uh, structures, it turns out that you can actually collapse to a microscopic level those waveguide requirements. So instead of needing uh, a pathway that's roughly the size of the wavelength, you could cut it down by a factor of 30 or something. It's sort of, sort of like going from vacuum tubes to transistors to integrated circuits, that micro miniaturization. It turns out that these particular phenomena uh, of metamaterials, as we call them now, permit that kind of microscopically shrinking the size of what you need. So what that means is that you end up with really very nanoscopic waveguides that can carry the energy at those frequencies, even though ordinarily, if you're building a waveguide, it wouldn't be able to do that. So it's, it's an unusual property of the juxtaposition of these unusual particular materials together that gives you that sudden uh, advantage of being able to miniaturize uh, your waveguide. So in a relatively small piece of material, you could send a lot of energy and a lot of signal uh, that ordinarily before metamaterials were discovered, uh, you would think you'd need to have a whole raft of pipes to carry a signal. Okay, great explanation, Hal. I really appreciate that. And um, my apologies to Arthur for having not been clear in my <laughs> original description of what was going on. So uh, I want to flash back for just a second, Hal, uh, to... The, my very first visit down to Austin when I spent a couple of days with you and your team. And we were, we were just talking and there, there was a question that popped into my head. I never really asked it. It kind of got answered just through the conversations over lunches and dinners and that kind of thing. But you've, you've had this, this life and career that is unlike the vast majority of us in terms of the, the circle of people that you associated with, the technologies you're associated with. Um, so here's a here's kind of an off the wall question for you. All right, you met a, a lot of interesting people. Who is one of the most interesting people you've ever met, and why? Oh, that's that is really an interesting question. Um, actually, I could start in part and say you. <laughs> no, okay, so exclude me from it. Exclude let's, you. Let's, okay. okay, exclude, exclude me. You. Go, exclude go you. through, through the, some, some of the weird circles that you've, you've, you've <laughs> run in. Because I saw photographs of you with all kinds of different people that are just internationally recognized. Well, certainly Edward Teller, uh, that, that was a very interesting uh, kind of meeting. Of course, Edward Teller is you know, known to be the father of the H-bomb. And at the time, I was investigating um, vacuum energy, zero-point energy. It's, it's kind of an underlying cauldron of energy that exists even in empty space. And so I was told that, uh, and he, he wanted to get a briefing from me on it. And so, okay, uh, I agreed to do that. So I went out to New Mexico where he was to, to give him a briefing. And I was told in advance that when you're briefing Ed Teller, he will sometimes kind of drop his eyes and fold his hands and you'll be sure that he's fallen asleep. But keep going. He's not asleep, he's thinking. So, no, okay. Sure enough, I swear to God, he looked like he had fallen asleep in front of me. But anyway, I kept going. Suddenly he pops up his head and says, okay, so that means if you put a couple of plates close together, like a couple of microns apart, uh, you'll get an attractive force between them from the energy in the vacuum. Uh, it'll go as a fourth power, inverse fourth power, of the, and it'll have a value. He actually worked out in his head as a math genius what it takes me, a desk full of books to figure out. And so that was absolutely 
it, it was just, it was kind of unbelievable to me that uh, somebody could have such a brilliant mind that he, he, he could do that. And so that, that, that was certainly a, a really interesting. And, and I love that story. Um, <laughs> that, that I was hoping you'd tell that one, but I didn't want to pick it for you just in case there was another one. Uh, okay, no, um, good, listen, yeah. Hal, thank you so much. A as always, it's, it's just a blast to spend time with you. I, I know that the audience out there uh, has, is, is just going to be energized by number one, getting to know you just a little bit, but also getting insight into your perspective on a number of the projects that, that To The Stars Academy has going on. Um, let me also thank uh, our listeners out there who submitted questions. And thank you so much for tuning in. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And if you enjoy it, please rate and review the TTS Talks podcast on Apple. Uh, stay updated on our latest news and developments by TTSA by uh, visiting the tothestarsacademy.com website and sign up for our mailing list. Have a great rest of your day and thanks again for tuning in. For more TTSA talks, please visit tothestarsacademy.com.